delighted to welcome Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester and former Labour Health Secretary. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Oh, goodness me, that was a very loud microphone. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear you bursting with life there. Um, let, let's talk about where we are in terms of uh, the vaccine rollout. Extraordinarily successful rollout. I mean, forget any of the party politics here. 12 million people vaccinated, a huge percentage of the EU, a tiny fraction of that. We are doing very well. Uh, next week, government likely to hit that target of the um, all over 70s and vulnerable groups uh, being able to uh, be vaccinated. Um, you've been concerned, though, that particularly about um, not just ethnic minorities, but poorer people in poorer regions not taking up the vaccine at the same rate. Big concern given that they are more likely to be frontline workers, key workers, not able to work with a laptop at home and more at risk. What do you want to see changed in terms of that vaccine rollout? Well, firstly, just to echo what you said, Julia, the, the rollout so far has been a great success. And I've said to the minister, credit, credit to you and to the government and also to everybody working on the ground, because in Greater Manchester, there's just a huge effort going on. So many people involved. It's fantastic to see. So, yes, absolutely agree with you there. What I am saying to the government is we've gone in the first phase giving vaccine to all areas equally. Uh, and that's been right when we're dealing with the very elderly. But when we're getting now into the lower age groups, I think we have to recognise the fact that the death rate from COVID has been twice as high in some of our poorer communities in parts of the north than it has been in some more affluent areas. And one of the reasons for that is people in those areas uh, tend to have poorer health at an earlier point in their life. So uh, somebody in Manchester, a man in his 60s, will have the same level of health as somebody in their 70s somewhere else. And it's also the case, Julia, in those communities that more people have been out at work all the way through the pandemic uh, and are therefore exposed to much greater risk. So what I'm saying to the government is, they should surge supplies into those communities where life expectancy is lowest, still working within the, um, the overall parameters set by the JCVI. But if they were to do that, I believe they would save more lives than yeah. if they proceeded with an approach which was kind of completely equal uh, across the yeah. country. And this is the reality. Middle class people in better health over the years um, are, are, are in, working from home are far less likely to not just to get COVID, but to actually get seriously ill from COVID. As you say, we've seen that in the stats. Um, do you I mean, do you expect that to start once all the over 70s are vaccinated? Do you think after over 50s are vaccinated? When do you want that surge to start immediately? I think it should start after the first phase has been completed in, in mid-February. Um, because the reality is, as you just said, you know, somebody out there in their 60s with not brilliant health who's out there driving a bus or a taxi today or working in a supermarket, they are clearly, to me, at the same or even more risk than somebody at home in their 70s who doesn't have particularly bad health. I mean, that's, that's the fact that I'm pointing to here. So age is a consideration, definitely, but it needs to be seen alongside uh, life expectancy and the fact that uh, in some parts of the country, life expectancy is much lower. The gap is about 10 years. So yeah. between the poorest and the most affluent, there's a 10 year life expectancy gap. And I just think the rollout has to recognize that, Julia. I'm not seeking to play any politics with it. I'm not trying to sort of complicate it unnecessarily. I'm just trying to, to, to yeah. apply my, uh, my, my thinking to this. And that is, if you focus supplies on those areas, you will actually protect more people who, Let's be honest, I'm probably feeling pretty vulnerable going out to work at the moment with all of these new strains around. Yeah, indeed. Um, and what about the issue with ethnic minorities? I know in certainly the city of Manchester, you cover a much bigger area than that, Greater Manchester, but the city of Manchester is something like a third of the population being ethnic minorities. We know some ethnic minority groups far less likely to take up the vaccine, even when offered the vaccine, which is a really, really big concern that we are seeing a big discrepancy in terms of people actually taking the vaccine because of concerns that it's uh, either not, you know, not appropriate for someone who's a Muslim, completely untrue or, or, or over safety concern. How do we tackle that other than, I mean, some brilliant videos have been put out by um, ethnic minority celebrities and, and trusted voices to try and sort of say, look, you know, I'll take the vaccine. My mum's taking the vaccine. Other than people doing that, what else can we do to make sure that people who need the vaccine take the vaccine? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. You know, it was great to see uh, Sadiq Khan and Nadeem Zahawi, the minister, doing a, a joint appeal because um, I think things like that may, may have an impact where... Yeah cross-party people make an appeal. Um, <clears throat> but you're right, it is a real concern. And I think there's there's just stuff out there about the vaccine, isn't there? All kinds of rumours are going round about it's not appropriate for people in certain communities or it causes infertility is another yeah. a, another myth uh, that's going around in, in younger women. 
I, I think to answer your question, we've discussed this at Greater Manchester. We think maybe GPs, if they can, starting to ring round um, uh, people who, who are, you know, have not taken it, you know, to see if extra reassurance can be provided or, or other, uh, other clinicians uh, doing that. We also think we need to see that refusal rate. Um, the government currently isn't providing that to local areas. And I think we, it would help us to have that rate so that we could understand where there may be a particular problem in a particular community. Because the rumour mill goes round, Julia, doesn't it, in certain areas. Yep. We also know that leaflets are being put through doors in certain areas, which uh, is providing <clears throat> sort of anti-vax um, mm. uh, propaganda. So all of these things need to be looked at and perhaps providing trusted information in, in a range of languages might help as well. Can we also talk about, I mean, as a former health secretary yourself uh, under Labour, um, since your time in power, there have been major health reforms instigated by our former Tory health secretary, Andrew Lansley. It's emerged at the weekend that uh, Boris Johnson plans to basically uh, turn back those health reforms massively fought uh, at the time. I can remember I was hosting various NHS conferences at the time where doctors were sort of two man and woman horrified by these reforms. Um, turning back the clock and, 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 and going back again, do you think that's the right decision? Yes, I do. And I was shadow health secretary at that time, so I remember uh, being at those conferences with you. And I fought those reforms tooth and nail. And while I agree with Boris Johnson in calling time on them, we've had 10 years of them and I just wish... Uh, wish they'd have listened to the, the doctors at the time who were saying this, this isn't the right uh, path for the NHS. We got very close to scrapping them, actually. It was a Royal College of Surgeons were the only uh, professional body we couldn't persuade to, uh, uh, to oppose the reform. And I think they would have gone down if, if they had have opposed them. But here we are, yep. 10 years on. I think the one thing you can say is it appears that there is now a very strong political consensus about the NHS, that it should be um, public. Uh, and uh, there should be um, clear political oversight. The one thing I would say to the government is don't centralise everything. You know, don't take control and then pull it all into Whitehall because you've tried to run test and trace all from Whitehall uh, in the pandemic and it's not gone particularly well. Yes, have more political control, but use that to give more devolution to areas like Greater Manchester and other parts of the country. OK, let me also ask you about uh, the Labour leader. Uh, you're someone who stood for the Labour leadership some years ago before moving on to become Mayor of Greater Manchester. Lots of question marks being raised by left and right within the Labour Party over Keir Starmer's current leadership. And the fact that, you know, OK, despite the obviously massive success with the vaccine rollout, so many criticisms of the uh, Conservative government over, over lockdown from one side... Uh, uh, and uh, and over the huge death toll from uh, perhaps all sides. Um, and uh, yet Keir Starmer not really seeming to make any progress in the polls whatsoever, still languishing behind the Conservatives. Is uh, Keir Starmer the person to lead Labour back into power? I, I, I think so. I think he's made a, a good start in very difficult circumstances. It's hard to be leader of the opposition uh, Julia, I've worked with a number and I, you know, I, I recognise how tough it is to get to get heard. And particularly in a national crisis, the opposition should provide support to the government wherever it can. And, and Keir has done that on many issues, rightly. But then that blunts his approach as leader of the opposition. So he's kind of not been in normal circumstances. But even within that, I think he's made a really uh, good, strong start. And, you know, I, I think he is <clears throat> bringing people back to Labour. So there's a long way to go. I think we would all recognise that. But certainly, I think um, Keir is heading in the right direction. Have you given up on your own leadership ambitions? Well, I, I, I could have kicked myself yesterday because this was in the uh, papers. It was just a, a, an off-the-cuff comment. Somebody asked me, did I still have the ambition? And the truth deep down inside is, one day, if it <laughs> came about that I could, then yes, I'm just being honest, I, I would like to. Because I've tried twice, after all. So it would be bits of a bit of a lie if I, if I said it would, it would never appeal to me. But the truth is, I'm not, I'm not expecting to, Julia, I'm not expecting to go back to Westminster. I believe the job I'm in will be the last job I will do in politics. Um, so, you know, I'm not plotting any, any return. Okay. Uh, so that will cheer, that'll cheer your listeners up to know that I'm not heading back to Westminster. <laughs> that Probably cheer Kiss Tom Rub as well. Andy Burnham, uh, Mayor of Greater Manchester, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. 8.17 is the time. Let's bring in Benjamin Butterworth, listening to all that. Late editor at the iPaper. Lots to take in there. Um, just, fi just finally on the, on the issue of, of Keir Starmer's leadership. Do, do you think it's strange that actually Keir Starmer is not making more headway uh, given uh, where the Conservative Party is and so much criticism of their policy from different directions? 
Not really, no. I think Keir Starmer is a pretty good Labour leader, pretty good leader of the opposition. I'm not sure if he's good enough to be Prime Minister, which is, you know, the basic of the job. But I think the fact is Labour was in such an unbelievably poor position, uh, what, just 10 months ago when Keir Starmer became leader, because the very idea or that Labour could form a government seems so distant from where Jeremy Corbyn left it. And so many core Labour voters didn't vote for Labour because of Jeremy Corbyn and because of the Brexit question, that I think there's an absolute mountain to climb. And it would be delusional to think you could turn that around so quickly. I do fear that he's becoming a little bit too much like Ed Miliband and not enough like Tony Blair. And I hope he, he shows a bit more a bit more oomph in the remaining sort of four years that he's got as, as leader of the opposition. OK.